Good to see you all today. And uh, yeah, you, great you can be here and celebrate with us. And celebration needs food, so help yourself. Um, I can do that with everyone who's here. There's a bit of interaction here. It is Easter, and the, 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 the call is Christ is risen. The response is, he is risen indeed. That is awesome. Um, every Easter, I think of Karen's grandma, who she called Babu and you called Tanya. And I think... Easter was her favorite time of year. I, I, I personally think that. She grew up in Iran uh, as a Orthodox Christian. And she would sit down with me and tell me her stories growing up with the traditions. And Lent was a big deal. She could not have any fun during Lent. Uh, she had to be depressed, basically. But boy, was that a buildup for Easter, because Easter was a celebration, and it just exploded all over the place. And they went to house to house, and they played games with eggs, and they ate colich, and they did all this stuff. Um, and, and she would tell me the stories of her life, and then then as her she had her daughters, and as they grew up, and then as their daughters started having kids, and some of them uh, were in Iran as well. And so they had stories that went on. And every Easter, if you remember her, she would say, Crystal's uh, Vasgres. And the response is, Vaisimo Vasgres. And you've already said it in English, but we can do this just to remember her. Hey, Crystal's Vasgres. Vaisimo Vasgres. Okay. I will be playing the egg game later today, just so you're aware. Anyway. Christ is risen. I, uh, we, we need to say that precisely. It's not that he has risen. He is risen. And that makes all the difference in how we approach this. I'm going to read um, from several different accounts. Well, several. From, from three of the accounts, each of the uh, gospel writers deal with Jesus' resurrection a little bit differently. And um, it just, it wouldn't, I, I, I'm going to do it because I think we need to do it. But I'm going to start with Matthew. No, I'm going to start with Luke. Luke 24, starting at verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices that had been prepared and went to the tomb. They found that the stone was rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered it, they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like light lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? That's a good question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you that while he was still in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men to be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Now let's flip to Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 8. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. And they came to him, clasped his feet, and worshipped him. But Jesus said to them, don't be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go to Galilee and report what to me, uh, report that they will see me. Uh, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went to the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. And when the chief priests met with the elders, they devised a plan to have the soldiers pay a be paid a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. 
if the report gets to the governor, we'll satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So when the soldiers took the money as, and did what, as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Um, John picks up the story in John 20. We'll start at verse 3. So Peter and the other disciples started out for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. John is writing this. He's the other disciple. I'm faster than Peter. I made it there first. He bent over and looked in the, uh, at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb, and they saw the strips of linen right, uh, lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head, for the cloth was folded up by itself, separated from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside, and he, he saw and believed. Well, they still didn't understand from Scripture that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Back to Luke. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles away from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And he asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along the way? And they stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you a visitor to Jerusalem and don't know the things that have happened here these days? And Jesus gives the best one-liner in all of Scripture. If you think that Jesus is boring, I want you to read the Gospels, understanding he is telling jokes all throughout it. This is the best one-liner ever. He says, what things? <laughs> so they explained to him. They said about Jesus of Nazareth. They replied, he was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And when they crucified him, and they crucified him, and we all had hopes that he was going to be the one to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of, an, and of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they didn't see him. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what he said, what was said in scriptures concerning him. And as they approached the village, he, uh, which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going to go further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us for it's almost evening and the day is almost over. So he went to stay with them. And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he gave thanks and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. There's something about food being revelatory. Also, they had just seen him on the night he was betrayed do the same thing. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened up the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem when they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen. And he has appeared to Simon, and the two told what happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke bread. Back to John, verse 19. On the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together, with the doors locked out of fear for the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and his disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. 
If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, unless I see the nail prints in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. Thomas was given the label doubting Thomas. But if you look at what he's actually saying here, and look what he said when they were going to go into Jerusalem. When Jesus turned his face towards Jerusalem, Thomas said, let's go and die with him. Because they knew what was going to happen. Thomas was not a doubter. He was a realist. And it is a very good place to be, to say, unless the Jesus of history is the Christ of faith, I'm not going to believe. We'll get into that a bit later. What did Jesus do? About a week later, the disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, Lord, I believe, my, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe. And Jesus did so many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which aren't recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing them, you may have life in his name. Can we pray? Lord, we thank you for this day to remember. For this season of remembering, Lord. As we remember how you loved your own to the end and washed all of their feet on the night that you would be betrayed. And how you taught them that your body and blood were the new covenant. And we remember your betrayal and your death. And Lord, we remember Sunday. Remember the day that you rose again. So, Lord, today here, I don't know what people are going through. I don't know what situation we're all in. But I do know that today can be a day that you are resurrecting us. So, Lord, give us ears to hear and hearts to obey what you tell us to do. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a question for you today that you might not have thought about for some time. Why does the empty tomb matter? You know, before you give an automatic response, I want you to think about a couple of things that you may not have ever thought about before. First, crucifixion was common. And second, resurrection happens. <laughs> Let me explore that just for a bit. Crucifixion was common. Crucifixion was the form of execution uh, that Rome used from about the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD when the first Christian emperor decided to outlaw it because out of respect for Jesus dying on the cross. I don't think Rome became a nicer Rome. I think, anyway, uh, it was almost a thousand years. It was used to uh, acts of piracy, slave revolts, desertion by soldiers, treason, any other crime considered serious by the Roman state. 
the, the most notorious mass execution by crucifixion was when um, Spartacus rebelled uh, in 73 to 71 BC when when uh, Spartacus was a gladiator that rebelled and the slaves revolted. And when they finally put that rebellion down, they did 6,000 crucifixions from along the Appian Way from Capua to Rome as a warning to the million other other slaves in Rome that they do not revolt. Um, That we don't know how many people Rome killed by by crucifixions, but it could be in the tens or even hundreds of thousands over the course of a thousand years. It was not a it was a horrific way to die, but it wasn't uncommon. Secondly, resurrections happen. Um. <laughs> Elijah raised the son of the widow of Zarephath. Elisha raised the son of the Shunammite woman. Um, you got to hear this story. When when Elisha had died and his bones were placed in a grave, they were uh, somebody somebody else had died, and um, they were trying. To, they they brought the body to the graveyard, and some people came to attack. The Israelites and they they had to they had to hide themselves and hide the body. So they threw the body in the open grave where Elisha bones were, <laughs> and the dude came back to life. <laughs> it's 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 amazing. Um, Peter raised Tabitha. Paul raised Uticus when he preached too long, and Uticus got tired and he fell out of the window. And when you preach and someone dies because you're that boring, you better raise them back to life. I, it's just something that should be done. Um, and and Jesus, think about this. Jesus never came early or just in time or even late to a funeral that he didn't mess up. Every time he went to a funeral, he raised the dead. It's, it's, yeah, what, it, can you, anyway, Jesus is awesome. And when Jesus died, we also get an account in Matthew 27, 52 to 53, that the, uh, the, the tombs were also opened when Jesus died on the cross. The, the veil was ripped in the temple, and it wasn't whatever you've been taught. Like the, the reason, the, the, the metaphor for the veil ripping was a father ripping off his clothes in grief, ripping his shirt in grief. From top to bottom, the veil was torn because God witnessed his son dying. Yes, it made a way to the most holy place, but that wasn't the reason it was ripped. It was ripped to show the father was grieving. So the temple, temple broke, the sky went dark, the earthquake the earth started to quake, the graves opened up, and people who recognized people they had recently buried came back to life. We don't talk about that, I, because I don't know what happened. It's, it's, anyway, it's in the book. Um, so, if crucifixion was fairly common and resurrections were something that happened, why was it so significant that Jesus died and rose again? Well, first of all, the empty tomb matters because the cross proved that he was human and the grave proved that he was God. The empty tomb proved that he was God. There's eight places that I found. Well, I found seven. And then I asked ChatGTP to find all of them for me, and it gave me a bunch. That, I thought we had 12, but ChatGTP lies sometimes, and I argued with it. And so I, I settled on eight things. Seven would have been perfect, but I, I found actually eight times that Jesus associated and said, I'm the Son of God. Not that somebody calls him the Son of God, and then he agrees with them, but eight times. And those are listed on the screen, or you'll find them on the notes when I put it online. But by Jesus saying he's the son of God, like this is why he was killed. People recognized he was equating himself with God. People 
couldn't have him going around talking like he's God. And so they killed him. But also, Jesus was the one. That he, they, they wanted a sign. And so they said, this is the sign. This is the only sign I'm going to give you. Matthew 12, 29, 40. I think I forgot to put it on there. But he says, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus predicted his resurrection. Nobody else has done that and has been successful. Okay? <laughs> There's a lot of people who want to start a religion. And so they say, after I die, I'm going to be resurrected on this day. None of them have been able to do it. The reason why his death and resurrection are so significant is because his by the sh everything changed at the cross, right? Like everything changed at the cross. Our sins were forgiven. I didn't, this is bonus, so this is coming off my head, okay? Our sins were forgiven. We were made friends again with God. We were um, expiation, propitiation. Now, these are words I should actually be defining for you. Um, anyway, everything changed at the cross. Because of his blood, because of his shed blood, I don't understand why without the shedding of blood, there's no remission for sins. I don't get that. But I do understand he was the perfect sacrifice and his blood was once and for all made a way for us to become friends again with God. His resurrection is the sign that this life, well, I'll get into that too, but this life isn't all that we have. It's eternity begins and it goes on forever. He predicted he would rise again, and he did. Basically, what he's saying is that the Jesus of history is the Christ of, Christ of faith. Just as doubting Thomas, unless I see, I'm not going to believe. Jesus gave them the sign that he would be in the ground three days and be raised again so that they might believe so that we might believe. The good news to me is that when Thomas made that declaration, Jesus responded right where he was at, right? He comes into the room and says, see my hands, see my side. And when Thomas saw Jesus, he didn't need to see his hands and see his side. I don't know where you're at, but maybe you need a deeper revelation of God or a reminder of your revelation that you've had of God. Faith is our natural response to his revelation. And so as he reveals himself good and true and right and honorable, as he reveals himself as loving and caring, as he re we need to be in that place where we get that revelation from him. What that generally takes is time and space. Because he is always with us. And what we need to be to be do to be with him is just be still and know that he is God. Will you ask him to reveal himself to you? And will you put yourself in a place of greater revelation? So the empty tomb matters because it proves that he is God. The second reason that the empty tomb matters is that it provides hope for us. 
Let me read. Oops. I'm going to have to look up that thing. First Corinth, I can read it here. First Corinthians 15, 1 to 19 says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles, and least of all, he appeared to me as to one abnormally born, for I am the least of the apostles and don't deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. But if we preach that Christ has not been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If we preach Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection from the dead? If there's no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we found out to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he was raised from the dead. But he didn't, if he would, did not raise him, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, as, and you're still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this, our future, uh, yeah. Forget. Uh, basically, he goes on and says, "Oh, it's up there. We are to. Be, <laughs> if for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men, all people." You can look at the evidence of Jesus's resurrection, which is. I. I it. it there are it, there is so much more proof that Jesus rose from the dead than Julius Caesar ever existed. And we've got coins with Julius Caesar's head on. When you take an honest look at what's available historically, Jesus did live. He did die. He did rise again. You have to rewrite history for that not to be self-evident. You can have complete trust that the God who raised Christ Jesus from the dead is with you. In fact, the same power that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is within you. It's not just a little bit of that great power that conquered death and the grave. It is the power of God that is with you. Our future hope is is hope that begins now. Eternity begins the moment we come to that realization that Christ is Lord. We don't make him Lord. We come to that realization that he is Lord. And when that happens, eternity begins and it goes on forever. And when we hear, well, I want to somehow park this around. We're not our hearts burning within us. 
You know, when, when, when you start talking about the things of God and his love for you and, and understanding that, that he is for you and not against you and understanding that he is going to finish the good work he started in you and understanding that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in you, that should be something that stirs within you. That should be something that says, okay, I'm, I'm going to be okay to make it through this because I'm with God and he's with me. As long as I'm with God, he is with me. Hmm. Will you awaken to the hope of the eternal? We're told that the God of all hope will fill us with peace and joy as we trust in him. So we'll overflow with hope by the power of Holy Spirit. I mentioned yesterday, it's, it's, we don't need much faith. We need the faith of a mustard seed. We need the faith of the Father that the disciples could heal the boy who was demon-possessed. And he said, I, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. We don't need much faith. And anyway, yeah. I'm, I'm anyway. I'm firmly convinced that faith is simply our response to His revelation. So we put we're, we put ourselves in the place of revelation. Our faith starts to grow. You want to grow your faith? It's not through any effort on your part. It's responding to what He has done and is doing in your life. Okay. So the empty tomb proves he was God. The empty tomb provides hope for us. And the third thing is the empty tomb shows us we have a job to do. Found this video from a few years ago from N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright is a New Testament scholar, Pauline theologian, and Anglican bishop. And I like what he has to say about this. So hopefully this video will work because... According to the New Testament, something quite extraordinary, unprecedented, unheard of, and unimagined happened that first Easter day. It wasn't just that the disciples felt that maybe life was going to go on and it might be all right, perhaps. It was that suddenly they discovered that the Jesus who they'd known to be very thoroughly dead and buried was alive again, and not just alive in what we call a spiritual sense, actually bodily alive. And quite quickly, because being first century Jews, they were used to this framework of thought, they began to put two and two together and say that the God they believed in, who was the creator of the whole world, had begun the work of new creation. The resurrection narratives aren't about, oh, well, that's all right, you go to heaven after you die. In fact, that's precisely not what they're about, because they're about God remaking the whole world, starting with Jesus Often people preach sermons on Easter Day saying, in effect, oh, well, Jesus is alive again, so he's gone to heaven, and one day we'll go and be with him. That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are not saying. What they're saying is, Jesus is alive again, therefore new creation has begun, and therefore we have a job to do. And that job was quickly phrased in terms of God's larger project to bring heaven and earth together into one. Because at the heart of the Easter message is not just uh, a good news about something that happened a long time ago, not just good news about what God will do by and by. The risen Jesus says to his followers, the people who are just coming to terms with the transformation of their own misery, never mind anything else, he says to them that they now have a job to go out and say something and do something in the world. And the thing that they have to do and say in the world has a slogan which we often belittle. Jesus says, you've got to go out and announce repentance and forgiveness of sins. And for us, that has often in the Western tradition just mean I have to repent of my sins and I will be forgiven by God. But actually, it's much bigger than that. It's a message rooted in the resurrection of Jesus, which says that new starts are possible that whole communities and nations and peoples can look at the direction they've been traveling in and say, wait a minute, we're going in exactly the wrong direction. We need to turn around and go in the other direction. 
And that when that happens, then God, almost with a divine sigh of relief, says, I'm going to release you from the past, from all that enslaves and shackles you, not only individually, but as communities. The message of repentance and forgiveness flows directly out of the message of resurrection, because it is all about God saying, this is the time when new creation is starting. You can leave the old behind and follow Jesus into the new life that he has prepared for all who will take him seriously. Love that turn of phrase. He's prepared for all who will take him seriously. We do often just talk about repentance in the terms of what do I need to repent of? And if what you're hearing is that God wants a relationship with you that goes far beyond anything you could ever think or imagine, and, and you've been just sort of dangling your feet, and you know you haven't agreed that he is Lord, there, there might be something for us today to remember that, that Easter and spring and and what Jesus did rising again is all about that new creation. It's all about making all things new. Like it can happen. It can happen. It will happen when you become interested in what he can do what he can do for you when you bow your knee to him and when it and not only if you've never done that before but but for those of us who have said that prayer and it was years ago and we have never really experienced anything else we haven't seen a big transformation because we were never really that bad to begin with You need to understand that, that sin separates us from God, and it is only by His grace. And His grace that so powerfully works in us that we can say, I am by, uh, by the grace of God, I am who I am, and His grace to me was not without effect. Because I worked harder than anybody, but not me, but His grace that works through me. It's His cosmic dance we're in with the divine. And, and if you aren't awake to that, if you aren't awake to the reality that, that eternity starts now, it started, and, and, and you better start living it. Because the world is groaning with anticipation for the sons of God and, and sons and daughters of God to be revealed. I don't believe that's when Jesus comes and we get all transformed and then the world gets remade. I believe that when we are in this world, we're responsible for this world. And it's not a matter of us telling the world they need to repent. It's a matter of us humbling ourselves and praying and seeking God. Then he will hear from heaven, will forgive our sins, and will heal our lands. The message of Jesus is one of hope. It is one of transformation. It is one of invitation where we walk in this creative, this divine dance with the Creator. question you can think of is, will, will you keep your account short with God? Is there something that you personally need to repent of? 
as a church, we need to be thinking, is there something we need, need to repent of? Is there something we together need to turn around and go in the opposite direction? And because it's Easter, this time on the calendar that we decide to remember that Jesus rose again, it's an invitation for us to do that now. All things are made new. All things. How do you put yourself in a place for greater revelation? How do you awaken to hope? And how do you keep account short with God? My suggestion for you is to understand the rhythm of awe. And I think I've talked about this with you before. But the rhythm of awe is is a matter of doing it with our whole heart. We, we make a decision, we have an action, and we experience an emotion. So it means that the A is that we agree to be amazed. We decide that we're going to be amazed at God. That could be you're reading Scripture, and you're going to read Scripture until it blows you away. It could mean that you're going to go look out at the skies. If you're going to do it on April 8th, get some sunglasses. I got some that you can look at the eclipse. But um, uh, (laughs) be amazed at the creation of God. Like if you got to go to the mountains and do do a hike to connect with God, go do that. But, but have that regular rhythm in your life for your, where you are, are going to have your mind blown by the creativity of God or by the presence of God or by the, the person of God. Question you can ask is, what do you want me to see today, Lord? The W and R reminds us to work with what works for you. It's, it's, it's totally... I can't say this is how you do it. Maybe it might, for you, it might be spending time with your grandkids or spending time with your kids, or it could be you're, you're just in that place that whatever connects you to God, maybe it's listening to classical music. Maybe it is, it is cooking and that the putting things together reminds you of the creativity of God, or maybe whatever it is, it, it, it's going to work with what works for you. What do you want me to do to be inspired by you, Lord? And then the E in awe, enjoy what's simple and intentional. I think every day we need to make space to come into the presence of God. Every day. There's a psalm that says, I will praise you seven times a day. Maybe we should do it seven times a day. I don't know. But take that space and that time that is going to work for you and it's going to connect you with God. You see, when you do that, um, you put yourself in a place for greater revelation. As you put yourself in place for greater revelation, as he shows you things, your faith rises up naturally. As faith is the natural response to his revelation. So your faith rises up and it awakens your hope. And so when my faith rises up, I can trust my trustable God. because, And then when I trust him, I'm filled with peace and hope as I trust in him. So I'll overflow with hope. And so that rises up. And then I, I need to remember to keep ca- account short with God on a personal level, but we need to talk about community as well. Let me give you this. And I'm talking to me. When was the last time you prayed for our prime minister? When was the last time you complained about him? Yeah, it, it honestly... The book says to pray 
for those in authority. Maybe that's what we need to repent of. Maybe we get the government that we deserve because we're not praying for our government. Anyway, that was a cheap shot. I could say any government leader. I, but, but honestly, that is not, our role is not to be joining in with the complaints. Our role is to pray for the peace of our country. It's to pray God's blessing on them. It's to pray that, that God's will would be done through them. If God can use Nebuchadnezzar and King Cyrus to do his will, they can definitely use our premier. Regularly be in awe of God and understand when you are, he is going to start poking holes in your, those things we let slide, those things that we need to repent of, those things we need to make right with him. He does it in his timing and his way. You don't meet, need me to give a list or to give you a bunch of scripture to, to study because Holy Spirit is going to show you exactly what pleases the Lord. Let's pray. Stand with me as we pray. Lord, I want to thank you for this season. I want to thank you for this time of year, this time that we can remember your death and your resurrection, the season of Lent that we could have used to prepare ourselves for this time. And Lord, I ask that you would give us a hunger for more of you, that we would have such a a desire for the awareness of your presence that we would seek you always and live, that we would seek you with all of our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would give us hearts to know you. I pray, Lord, for those who are seeking that they would have understanding come. And Lord, I thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives and the work that you're going to finish. Lord, I don't know what you want to do here, but I do know you want to bless. I thank you that it's your kindness that leads us to repentance. So, Lord, I pray that we would make space to be in awe of you and see the kindness of the Lord. And then be led to that place of repentance. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, here's Pastor Sean. He can close out the service.